Welcome to a retrospective view of 45 years in EHS. I am Larry Wong, the UCOP Associate EHS Director. For this webinar, I would like to not only share my 45 year journey in the EHS field, but also share some major changes and milestones in the EHS arena which I have observed over the years. A quick overview of my EHS journey. I began my career in 1974 as a radiation technician with the Radiological Health Branch at Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo. This is where they overhaul nuclear submarines. I worked in the environmental monitoring and dosimetry areas of the program. After one year, I was promoted to a health physicist. In 1977, I was offered an industrial hygienist position with Cal OSHA. As an industrial hygienist, I performed compliance inspections for the first eight years, and the last two years, I worked in the special studies unit where we performed field research on specific occupational health issues. Before I left Cal OSHA, I worked in the research and standards unit where I developed proposed regulations to present to the Cal OSHA standards board. In 1987, I moved to the Department of Toxic Substances Control commonly known as DTSC. I started there as a regional industrial hygienist and after one year I was promoted to become a section chief where I managed various environmental health programs. In 1989, I became an adjunct EHS instructor at UC Davis Extension where I taught EHS classes until 2004. These courses were part of the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, commonly known as NEIHS. It was a grant program to provide health and safety training to workers. In 2001, I was offered a program manager position at UC San Francisco. I spent five years at UCSF as a program manager overseeing the campus safety program. In 2006, I was offered the UCOP EHS program manager position, where initially the primary focus was to develop and implement the safety program for the office of the president. Other responsibilities was to provide support for UC system-wide projects and work groups. From 2012 to 2018, I was offered the opportunity to serve various stints as the interim EHS director at three UC campuses and at San Francisco State University. I also provided EHS technical support and advice to all the UC campuses and medical centers, including performing mock inspections and training to prepare the campuses for Cal OSHA inspections as part of the UC Lab Safety Settlement Agreement. In 2014, UC Davis began phasing themselves out of the NEIH grant program, so I began teaching health and safety classes at the UC Berkeley Labor Occupational Health Program, commonly known as LOHP. A little history regarding the State Occupational Health Program. In 1970, President Richard Nixon signed the William Steiger Occupational Health Act of 1970, which established the Occupational Safety and Health Administration commonly known as OSHA. OSHA has regulatory jurisdiction over the private sector, but does not have jurisdiction over the government sector. The Occupational Safety and Health Act allows states to establish state occupational safety and health program as long as the state program is at least as effective as the federal OSHA program. Health and safety in California. On June 24, 1971, the Selmar tunnel explosion occurred in a water tunnel Lockheed Shipbuilding and Construction was constructing for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Several months before, there was an earthquake near Selmar which ruptured gas lines. On June 23rd, the miners hit the gas pocket which resulted in a non-fatal flash fire. On June 24th, it was decided to resume the mining operations with additional ventilation and testing requirements for the gas. The plan was that operations would cease if gas levels exceeded 40% of the lower explosive limit. 
It was reported that several instances were recorded in which the gas levels exceeded the 40% LEL levels, but the job was not shut down. After the late shift change, a fatal explosion occurred, causing the death of 17 men. This incident was the worst mining and tunneling incident in California history and resulted in an increased awareness of health and safety issues in California. With the recent Selmar incident, there was strong legislative support for the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1973. The Department of Industrial Relations, Division of Industrial Safety, administered the program. An interagency agreement was established with the Department of Health, the Occupational Health Branch, to provide industrial hygiene support for the Cal OSHA program, and the Department of Health Industrial Hygiene Lab provided analytical services for Cal OSHA. In 1976, California passed the Occupational Carcinogen Control Act, which required the use of carcinogens to be reported to Cal OSHA. The act increased the classification of carcinogen violations from general to serious violations. As a result of this new statute, the Occupational Health Branch created the Occupational Carcinogen Control Unit to increase awareness of the new regulatory requirements and increase inspections for the users of carcinogens. In April of 1977, I was hired as an industrial hygienist in the Occupational Carcinogen Control Unit. I did public outreach, provided consultation to employers, including the city and county of San Francisco, and also conducted compliance inspections. Major findings during my inspections were that 5209 carcinogens, due to the complex regulatory requirement, every employer wanted to dispose of their 5209 carcinogens. From over 100 employees who were inspected, only IBM in San Jose was found to be the only employer to be in full compliance with 5209. Numerous asbestos uses were found. Most unusual was that all the wineries used a specifically made asbestos filter to filter their wine. The highest asbestos short-term exposure concentrations I found was 170 fibers per cc for break arcing operations and 120 fibers per cc for emptying bags of asbestos into a mixing vat. In 1977, the permissible exposure limit for asbestos was two fibers per cc and a short-term exposure limit of 10 fibers per cc. What does a cliff bar have to do with California occupational safety and health? Well, the Cliff Bar was developed in 1991 by Gary Erickson. He named the bar after his father, Clifford Erickson, who was his companion on several trips when they would venture into the Sierra Nevada mountains. It so happened that Cliff Erickson was a long-term safety engineer with Cal OSHA. So, the Cliff Bar was named after a fellow health and safety professional. One major incident which had national and international repercussions was an ongoing exposure incident to workers at the Occidental Chemical Plant on the DBCP line. The workers noted that no one in their line were able to have children. When they were tested, it was found that all the workers were found to be sterile. What was ironic is that in the 1960s, a researcher at UCSF Charlie Hine published an article which found DBCP had an adverse effect on the testes of animals. This incident led to numerous public hearings and resulted in an emergency DBCP regulation along with the creation of the 1981 Department of Industrial Relations Director's List of Hazardous Substances. It also led to the first workers' right to know regulations in the U.S., the Hazard Communication Standard in 1982. It was the Cal OSHA Hazard Communication Standards on which the first OSHA HAZCOM standard was based on. In 1978, the Occupational Health Branch was merged with the Division of Industrial Safety 
to form a combined agency within the Department of Industrial Relations. This agency was named the Division of Occupational Safety and Health, or DOSH. You may notice if you look at the Title VIII regulations in the Table of Contents for Chapter 4, it still refers to the Division of Industrial Safety. Other incidents which occurred at UCSF that are worth noting. In 1979, there was a Q fever outbreak for employees working with pregnant sheep. It resulted in 19 cases, which included one fatality. A Cal OSHA inspection took place and resulted in a special order being issued to UCSF, which addressed training, exposure controls, medical surveillance, and use of PPE, including N95 respiratory protection. A few years ago, with increased controls, training, and work practices, Cal OSHA withdrew the special order which was issued to UCSF. In 1981, there were complaints regarding the handling of anti-neoplastic agents at UCSF and several hospitals in the San Francisco Bay Area. Concerns were improper mixing, lack of procedures, agents being mixed on the patient floors with no controls, a lack of training, and lack of personal protective equipment. This resulted in a special order being issued to UCSF and several hospitals requiring them to mix anti-neoplastic agent in a specific type of biological safety cabinet. The special order also required the hospital to develop procedures and emergency spill plans and also provide training and proper personal protective equipment. In January 1987, Governor George Duke Majin announced in his budget proposal to turn back the Cal OSHA program to the federal government. This would result in a saving of $8 million per year because the Cal OSHA state program operated on a 50-50 split in which 50% of the funding would come from the federal government and the remaining 50% would come from the state budget. This would not completely kill the Cal OSHA program because Cal OSHA would still run a program to cover the public sector government employees. The major impact on worker health and safety is that federal OSHA regulations were not as stringent as California's, especially the PELs, which were based on the 1968 ACGIH TLVs and are never updated. Cal OSHA updated their PELs every three or four years. Also, OSHA staffing and coverage never approached the numbers of health and safety staff which Cal OSHA had established for the state of California. After the budget proposal announcement, approximately 25 to 30 percent of the Cal OSHA staff left the program for jobs in private sector or in other state agencies. It was later determined that the number of compliance inspections conducted by OSHA during the first year after the disengagement was only 25% of what Cal OSHA normally conducts in a year, and the number of citations issued by OSHA was only 14% of the number in which Cal OSHA issues annually. In 1988, an initiative led by Labor placed Proposition 97 on the ballot to mandate the reinstatement of the Cal OSHA program to levels pre-1987. The proposition passed in November 1988 with 53% of the votes and the program was reinstated in July of 1989. The program was reinstated. However, the Cal OSHA program was decimated due to the loss of several experienced health and safety staff. With the disengagement of Cal OSHA in 1987, I was reassigned to the Cal OSHA headquarters in the Research and Standards Unit. My assignment was to expand Section 5208, the asbestos regulation, from a four-page general industry regulation to an asbestos construction regulation, a general industry regulation, and a non-asbestiform regulation. A lot of the rulemaking was to incorporate the recently promulgated federal OSHA asbestos regulations, but we also wanted to keep California-specific requirements in the regulation. 
The PEL for the asbestos regulation would drop from 2 fibers per cc to 0.2 fibers per cc. It was over a thousand pages of rulemaking, which I completed by November of 1987. Knowing that I did not want to do rulemaking for my foreseeable career, in November of 1987, I moved to Cal EPA, the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Towards the end of the 1980s, there were concerns regarding California's economic competitiveness, especially due to the skyrocketing cost of workers' compensation insurance. SB 198 was the proposed solution. This mandated employers to develop and implement an effective injury illness and prevention program. The rationale behind this requirement was that if an effective IIPP were to be developed and implemented, loss rates would decrease and the workers' comp insurance rates would go down. In the 1970s and the 1980s, there were several instances of employers knowingly allowing unsafe conditions to exist which could have resulted in serious injuries or death. Some employers would also fail to notify employees or conceal serious health and safety hazards. The passage of the California Corporate Criminal Liability Act was passed as a deterrent for employers who may elect to expose their workers to serious health and safety conditions. Up until the end of the 20th century, callousia penalties were considered to be very low or moderate when compared with other regulatory agencies. This resulted in some companies not correcting violations and just considered penalties to be more or less the cost of doing business. In 1999, with the support of labor and the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, the state legislature passed AB 1127, which increased callousia penalties in several ways. Major changes were, one, the maximum penalty for serious violations increased from $7,000 to $25,000. Two, government agencies were no longer exempt from paying civil penalties for callousia violations. However, there was an exemption added for K-12 schools, community colleges, CSU, and UCs. If the individual school location received no serious callousia citations for two years, the school would be able to petition for a refund of the civil penalty. Three persons or corporations who have been found to have falsified a signed statement of abatement of a violation can be assessed a criminal penalty of up to $30,000 for an individual or up to $300,000 for a corporation. Let's talk about federal OSHA and the permissible exposure limits. The basis for the majority of the OSHA PELs at the time of the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 was the existing federal standards, which were the Wash-Healy Act in 1970, which referred to the 1968 ACGIH TLV listing. This became the basis for the OSHA PEL table in Title 29, Code of Federal Regulation, Section 1910-1000. In 1989, OSHA attempted to update its PELs and adopt new PELs for 164 new chemicals and revise the PELs for 212 chemicals. However, Labor, the AFL-CIO, filed a suit against OSHA asking the courts to overturn the PEL revisions because certain chemicals were not included in the 1989 PEL revision. In July of 1992, the federal courts overturned the OSHA PEL revision. To date, states which operate under federal OSHA jurisdiction still use the PELs which were adopted in 1970. However, for substances which were new, OSHA uses the general duty clause for exposure limits for the new chemicals. In November of 1987, I took a position with DTSC. Initially, I was a regional industrial hygienist for the Northern California Coast DTSC office. I will always remember my first field inspection with DTSC. It was a complaint which alleged two brothers were burying drums of hazardous waste on their property. 
It was also alleged that the brothers were known to have firearms and were willing to use them. So, at five in the morning on the date of the inspection, at a nearby Safeway parking lot, DTSC staff met with county staff and the county SWAT team to serve the warrant to inspect the property. The warrant was served and the property was inspected, but no buried drums were found. In 1988, I became a section chief in the DTSC Surveillance and Enforcement Unit, where we conducted inspections, primarily of permitted hazardous waste facilities, but also responded to hazardous waste complaints. The California hazardous waste regulations were a result of the Resource and Recovery Act, RICRA, of 1980. In California, pre-RICRA, the hazardous waste regulations were only six pages. In 1992, the Hazardous Waste Treatment Permit Reform Act was passed, which simplified the authorization process for treatment and storage of non-RICRA hazardous waste. The lower tiers of the authorization were permit by rule, commonly known as PBR, conditional authorization, also known as CA, and conditionally exempt, also known as CE. One of the requirements which many facilities were unaware of was that PBR and CE authorizations required the facilities to conduct an initial phase one environmental assessment. Another area which grew in the 1980s and 90s is household hazardous waste. Many cities and counties developed household hazardous waste collection programs to help minimize these waste streams from ending up in the landfill. From 1995 to 2001, I was a DTSC manager of the State Household Hazardous Waste Collection Program. It was noted that training requirements for household hazardous waste collection workers were sometimes not straightforward in states which did not have a state OSHA program. So at the request of the North American Hazardous Materials Management Association, commonly known as NAMA, I was given the opportunity to, to develop and carry through an ASTM standard. It was ASTM standard D6498, the standard guide for household hazardous waste training outline for household hazardous waste collection operations. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, businesses expressed concerns to the representatives that they were being inspected for hazardous materials by various city, county, and state agencies. They were being asked the same type of questions and businesses were paying multiple fees and getting multiple permits. In response to regulatory concerns by business, in 1993, the state legislature passed SB 1082 which created the Certified Unified Program Agency, or commonly known as the COOPA program, to regulate and manage six hazardous materials program in California. Businesses would receive one permit from the COOPA and would only pay a single fee. The COOPA program would be managed by Cal EPA with additional oversight from DTSC, the Office of the State Fire Marshal, Office of Emergency Services, and the State Water Resources Control Board. The six programs which the COOPA is regulated are the Business Plan, the CalArt Program, the UST Program, the Above Ground Petroleum Storage Act, the Hazardous Waste Generator and Tier Permitting Programs, and the Uniform Fire Code and the Hazardous Materials Management and Inventory Programs. COOPAs were either county, city, or local agencies who applied to Cal EPA to become authorized to run all six programs. Within some COOPA jurisdictions, there was a possibility for another agency to run one or more of the programs as a participating agency. Cal EPA initially delegated the COOPA application process to DTSC, where we would work with local agencies in the application process hold public hearings, and DTSC would make a recommendation to Cal EPA to approve or reject the local agency's 
Coupa application. The majority of the Coupas were county programs, but there were several counties in which a city or several cities elected to become a Coupa. Coupas are evaluated every three years by Cal EPA and the five affected state agencies. The California Coupa program has become the most comprehensive local government driven hazardous materials, hazardous waste, and emergency response program in the nation. In 2001, I moved from Cal EPA to UCSF. In the early 2000s, EPA found several colleges and universities were not properly managing hazardous waste. This was especially true in EPA Region 1, the New England states, and also at the University of Hawaii, which received a $1.7 million penalty for the improper management of hazardous waste. In the spirit of cooperation in 2001 and 2002, UC EHS leadership elected to conduct a self-audit of all 10 campuses and submit a self-disclosure to EPA, DTSC, and the local Coupas. At UCSF, there was a very unique research laboratory incident which led to UC partnering with Ansel Glove to fill a PPE gap in regards to chemical hand protection. At a research laboratory in the School of Dentistry, a researcher was doing a DNA extraction using phenochloroform. The researcher performing the procedure did it in a biological safety cabinet, not in a fume hood. He was wearing a lab coat and thin latex gloves. While transferring the phenochloroform from the container into the test tube, a small amount of phenochloroform dripped onto the edge of the test tube and ended up on the outside of the test tube. The liquid on the outside of the test tube made it slippery, and when the researcher held the test tube, it slipped out of his hand, causing the entire test tube of phenochloroform to splash onto his glove hands. The phenochloroform flowed down the glove, onto his arm, and eventually ended up in his crotch. He ended up going to the emergency shower to wash off the phenochloroform and was sent to the hospital. Because the phenochloroform got into his crotch, the doctor elected to hold the researcher overnight for observation. This normally would not be a callous reportable serious injury. However, the UCSF campus workers' comp manager elected to report this incident to the local Cal OSHA district office. Cal OSHA conducted an inspection of the incident and noticed that the phenochloroform manufacturer MSDS specifically stated, do not use thin latex gloves for protection. Cal OSHA cited UCSF for several violations, including a serious violation for not using proper hand protection. They assessed a civil penalty of over $30,000. We went into an informal conference where we managed to get the civil penalty reduced by roughly 50%. Prior to the informal conference, we did involve UPT, the union rep, to ensure that they were well informed about the issues regarding the violations. So when we met with Cal OSHA, the union rep did not agree with what the Cal OSHA inspector wanted. In the end, we found that there were no gloves on the market with good dexterity, which were conducive laboratory work. So we approached the local ANSO glove representative and ANSO agreed to work with UCSF to develop a thinner glove which provides protection against phenochloroform. This resulted in the development of the ANSO Chemtech Viton Butyl Glove. This goes to show that if you work with your vendors and present an issue to them, they will try to work with you to find a solution. In this particular situation, the University of California was ANSO's largest customer in the world, so they were willing to work with us to find a solution. In 2006, the California State Legislature passed the California Global Warming Solutions Act, which required California to reduce 
its greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. The California Standards Board also passed a fume hood regulation in 2006, which required laboratory fume hoods, which operate in the setback mode, to be tested using an abbreviated ASHRAE 110 method, which is the method for measuring performance of laboratory film hoods. Unfortunately, the ASHRAE 110 method requires the use of sulfur hexafluoride, commonly known as SF6, which is one of the worst greenhouse gases in the market. It has a global warming potential over 23,000 times greater than carbon dioxide. So in partnership with Technical Safety Services, or TSS, UC petitioned the Standards Board for variants which allowed UC to use nitrous oxide as a substitute gas for its ASHRAE 110 test, based on past construction trends within the UC system. It was estimated that ASHRAE 110 variants has reduced UC's greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 1 million pounds per year. On another note, UC is required to conduct research using various gases. The Air Resources Board was initially proposing to do an outright ban on the use of SF6 for all uses. During the rulemaking process, we were able to convince the Air Resources Board to allow for an SF6 exemption for research purposes. The unfortunate 2009 laboratory fatality at UCLA had a massive impact on academic research laboratories, not only in the US, but also internationally. It pushed some researchers to improve laboratory safety culture to prevent similar accidents. However, some of the changes pushed laboratory safety to a follow these rules and regulations mentality rather than improve the safety culture by having open communications regarding safety concerns and also improving safety training and education, which would include risk assessment and strong support from university management. In 2012, UC entered into a settlement agreement with the Los Angeles County District Attorney. The major requirements of the settlement agreement were a listing of all the labs, lab safety training for PIs and all lab personnel, development of SOPs, having a lab safety manual in the lab, developing safe use procedures for pyrophoric, conducting PPE hazard assessment, requiring the use of proper PPE, an enhanced reporting of serious injuries, and Cal OSHA would conduct up to three campus inspections per year during the length of the settlement agreement. As a whole, UC did a very good job in meeting the requirements of the settlement agreement. To help campuses prepare for the upcoming Cal OSHA inspection, for the eight campuses who requested support, I conducted mock Cal OSHA inspections to prepare the chemistry and biochemistry labs, in which I provided the laboratories with tips on what the Cal OSHA inspectors would look for and recommendations on what steps they could take to improve their chances on surviving the inspection. At the end of the settlement agreement timeline, the UC campuses did fare pretty well with the inspections. The only serious violations found were the types of gloves which were being used with pyrophoric chemicals and unguarded belts on vacuum pumps. In closing, to be successful in the eh &S field, it is important to develop good personal qualities, integrity, honesty, and virtue. These qualities will help you succeed with your customers, your coworkers, direct reports, and management. If you lack these personal qualities, you will not succeed. Be honest, be trustworthy, offer to help when needed. Fulfill your promises, treat others with respect, and give credit where credit is due, and be willing to admit when you're wrong. Since eh &S supports programs to implement their health and safety program, 
EHS is a technical expert we should offer to assist supervisors, managers, directors, and PIs to address health and safety issues insofar as practicable. You also need to develop personal relationships with your customers. When such relationships are established, you will be able to have trust and credibility with your customers, and they would more likely contact you for assistance. To be successful not only in the h &S field, but also in your everyday life, I suggest you look at persons who you admire. It could be a family member, a coworker, a supervisor, or a friend. Write down what are the qualities in that person that you admire. These are the qualities which you should try to develop and emulate to become a better colleague, better supervisor, or just a better person. Likewise, for that person who everyone in the office avoids, what are the negative qualities in that person? Do you have any of those qualities exist in you? If you do, you need to make a concerted effort to improve yourself and rid yourself of those negative qualities or everyone in the office may end up running away once you enter their office. In closing, I prefer not to look at career accomplishments, but rather look at 45 years and see the impact I've had on colleagues and friends. Activities which I was involved in, which gives me great pleasure, is being a part of the NEIHS training program to provide safety training and information to thousands of workers through fun and interactive training methods, visiting and interacting with EHS staff on the campuses to mentor, advise, and develop friendships. And lastly, developing student assistants who eventually became UC employees, such as Karen C and Bernadette Santos. That's my closing words of wisdom.